sharpen up now okay so let me just quickly give you an idea about your notes uh, some of you might find this a little bit confusing so let me just make everything uh, let me just clarify this for the moment I will change the labeling that will make it much clearer okay first what you need to focus on is this NSE trading project the core theory so what I've tried to do here is see in our introductory module is uh, on uh, economies and markets okay so in the longer version of the notes so now we are dealing with a longer version and a shorter version of the notes for that particular module economies and markets which is the most important uh, the starting module okay which is what you see here um, all right so this one starting initially with uh, giving you the rationale for the curriculum but essentially this whole thing starts with uh, economies and markets somehow this is a little frozen we go quickly to this economies and markets model which is module which is the first module essentially for your uh, it's an introduction to financial markets okay where you need to pick up a lot of the basics of financial markets before you do any of the uh, project trading and all so there are going to be two versions of this uh, module okay one is the longer version of the notes okay which i will organize very quickly so the part which is about the rationale for the curriculum this part i will reorganize into unit zero which essentially is just telling you why i've designed the curriculum the way i've designed it okay and then we will have unit one and unit one will have two versions a long version and the short version okay so the long version is uh, obviously longer and so initially what we want you to focus on which uh, the one which i'm calling the nsc project right now the core theory this will essentially become what we call the short version okay so this will become the short version of the of unit one are you guys following of unit one will be economies and markets and this will become the short version why do we have a short version because we hope to be starting the trading project very soon okay hopefully we'll get the ids by 8th of july and then we'll have two weeks of practice trading you getting used to the software which is quite a complex piece of software and then we will hopefully have uh, six weeks of clean project trading live project trading okay and that will end on 30th august as you go into your preparatory leave okay so that you'll finish your project and then you can prepare for your exams all right and i'll have the submission date after your exam so you have because there's nothing much uh, not much admin work involved in the submission so that's the plan we hope we can stick to the plan so therefore the problem is that in order to do this project you need actually a lot of base knowledge uh, but uh, at least ab absolute bare minimum core theory that I'm trying to put into the short version of unit one which is the short version of economies and markets because we don't have time before we start the project we don't have that many classes to teach you the basic theory is that clear and then later on once we finish the project uh, once we start the project I may go back to the longer version of the notes and cover some of that material okay so is this clear to everyone so far so this thing NSE trading project I'll rename it as short version of unit one okay and then you will have the long version of unit one which is what you see here and then I will create a then I will create a separate for unit zero which is basically giving you the rationale for the curriculum okay so just briefly to give you the rationale for the curriculum you can just look at it yourself as well okay uh, you can learn another new big word here a teleological perspective what does teleological mean does anyone know yes okay so essentially teleo teleology is, a, is is concerned with design and purpose okay it's a very useful word to know it's a big word and it's a useful word to know because it's uh, it has applications in your life as well it's always concerned with design and purpose so if you're making a chair or if you're making a, if you have a carpenter making a table so one of the things I should ask is what is this table going to be used for is it going to be a computer table is it going to be a teacher's writing desk or whatever it is okay so if you know what the purpose is it helps you to do that job a little better in a more effective way right so it's always useful to ask what is so when you take a teleological perspective on management education what that means is that you ask yourself what is the purpose of this MBA program so especially when we are we are trying to design the curriculum right so when you're trying to design the curriculum uh, what happens in most business schools is you stick you there is a curriculum which has been going on I mean these courses that you here see IPM and FDRM and all this stuff these things even when I did my MBA in 1988 
uh, it was still called IPM and it's still called IPM and pretty much the same material is being taught okay uh, so uh, the point is uh, how do you design it so if you want it I want to take a fresh look at it especially for the finance electives so my idea is I, I ask myself uh, what is the purpose of this MBA program so, and that will help me to design what I put into the curriculum okay so that's basically it so there you'll see you can go through this I'm not going to spend too much time on it so you can just go through this and so essentially what I have done is you will find uh, that there is a spreadsheet in your notes you can start looking at it if you have extra time you will see that there is a uh, spreadsheet here like this okay which essentially gives you the layout of the financial sector uh, the landscape of the financial sector so here what I try to do is take a look at all these uh, uh, firms that exist in the financial sector okay and then try to look at their functions okay so essentially I try to look at what you do uh, what each of these types of firms do everything is included here this is an exhaustive list including the government treasury okay so we'll go through all of this when we go to our unit 2 okay which is our firms and functions etc so we'll go through all this but essentially this is organized like this if you want you can start looking at it uh, just to get an idea so everything is included here okay including the corporate treasury the uh, CFO office everything and I've tried to look at all these different types of firms and what kind of roles they perform in the economy okay and the kind of skill sets that you need to perform these roles that, that comes from the examination of the roles itself okay and so I've tried to design the program in such a way that you develop the skill sets that you would need to work in any of these types of firms which are performing this kind of uh, function in the economy are you following this is the broad idea that's why you will find that uh, so essentially you can see all the steps here since we are going through this we can go through it a little bit okay so when you compare notes with some of your friends from college uh, who are also in MBA programs you will find that the kind of material that we are covering in the finance electives okay is could well be quite different from what they are covering okay and when you compare notes also compare whether they are doing uh, similar projects based on live uh, data etc okay a lot of people use simulations these are not simulations what you're going to be doing you're doing we are going to be working with live data and so no one knows what's going to happen even I don't know what's going happen what's going to happen so uh, so the idea is basically the purpose of an MBA program out produce outstanding business graduate who are those you take good business decisions what is a good business decision okay and then so far I mean the objective is to create finance students who take analytically rigorous business decisions in finance and who faces business decisions okay so when you start looking at uh, am I going too fast on this no, are you following yes. okay so I just want to in case you have confusions uh, that you know when you're comparing notes with your colleagues and with your friends in other business schools you'll find that the syllabus here could be quite different especially in the finance electives why is it different I'm just giving you an idea behind my thinking what drove me to select this kind of curriculum or design this kind of curriculum are you following okay so I look at so who is taking essentially we have to take uh, you have to pre you have to be prepared to take better decisions okay and solve the decision problems in a more analytically rigorous and effective way so who faces decision problems so it's the employees who are performing these finance focused roles in these types of firms okay either you're working in a commercial bank or in an investment bank or in an asset manager okay or in a in a government treasury or in a corporate treasury so I look at all these different forms and their functions and I look at what kind of decision problems you might face if you were working in any of these firms is that clear and so I try to design the curriculum in such a way that it helps you to solve these decision problems better okay so that is the thinking that has gone into it so that's why you'll find that even if you compare it to uh, typical finance textbooks you'll find that when you compare different finance textbooks uh, which are used in MBA programs in the second year you will find that they are all quite similar but when you compare it to what the curriculum that I've designed for you you'll find that there's a lot of difference you'll find that I'm not referring much to your textbook uh, 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 at all but uh, I will refer you to certain chapters in the textbooks which you have to study on your own okay so this is the thinking so I just wanted to share that with you so that you know you don't have so you understand where I'm coming from and what I'm doing why I'm, wh why I'm doing what I'm doing right okay uh, so far everyone follows okay not going too fast okay 
so if i'm going too fast or anything just please let me know immediately okay so you can start studying this stuff on your own uh, and there are a lot of uh, you know misconceptions that you will be able to clear up because a lot of people use terms uh, you know in inaccurately in the industry like uh, and uh, among the trainers and people like the firms that you would have talked to for your courses you'll see investment banking has become a buzzword in india so one of the things you'll learn is what exactly an investment bank is okay most of the time what they're doing is they're actually talking about m and a and they call it investment banking which is not correct okay m and a and investment banking are quite different so so this will be labeled this part a very short note on uh, unit 0 which is the rationale for the curriculum so i'll going to rearrange the notes like that okay so having done that let's go to uh, your okay and so uh, we had this discussion here yeah, let's go to your nsc So in the NSE trading project core theory, which is going to be the short version of your unit one. Now we already did this part. The last segment of that is this discussion that we had the previous day. Uptrends, downtrends and all that stuff, right? Okay. So uh, here I tried to give you a, a very brief introduction to uptrends and downtrends. But actually the discussion of uptrends and downtrends is connected also to the discussion of cycles. Okay. So I am trying to go in a little bit of a hurry here because I feel that there's a lot of material to be covered before you start the course. Okay. So we may actually go back and forth uh, in this trends and cycles business. So what I've done is what I will do here is um, let me put in um, Okay, so let me put in this little bit of a hyperlink here so that when we go, because here we discuss trends. Uh, okay, so we just very briefly discussed uptrends and downtrends. Okay, but what I will do, you have this, uh, I think I've already put it in your. Well, I don't want to scare you also. That's another reason that I. Uh, because some, some of the discussion on this uh, trends and cycles is a little theoretical uh, and if you read the English part of it you might find it a little confusing but if you look at the pictures it will be it won't be so confusing let me see where the yeah cyclicality in asset prices and so this is actually the uh, the long form theoretical discussion on uh, trends and cycles okay so I'll just briefly give you an idea of what so here when we discuss trends okay uptrends and downtrends now you know what an uptrend and a downtrend is so the only other connection I would make okay is this that if you look at uh, with this we can close now okay so this is the note that I'm going to link to so this note is already in your lecture notes okay cyclicality in asset prices cyclicality is another big word but it's very simple all it means is the phenomenon of exhibiting cycles okay so if you say that uh, seasons seasons exhibit cyclic uh, cyclicality if I make the statement seasons which means all this autumn for autumn summer winter spring these seasons exhibit cyclicality because they keep coming in cycles so you have a winter this year then again next year the same winter comes back okay the same type of season comes back okay so that's all that me uh, cyclicality means that is something is showing uh, the characteristic of appearing in cycles okay or moving in cycles that's all that means all that this means so what I'm doing here is I'm I am linking this note to um, this part here okay more detail on uh, trends and cycles okay so all right so we have a brief de de discussion we already had on the, the definition of uptrends and downtrends okay and so if you want to have a more theoretical understanding of uptrends and downtrends and how they are a part of cycles you can refer to this note but as i said it's written as a as a theoretical note just to uh, of course be it's written in a way that is uh, it's a slightly legalistic way of writing so you may get a little confused if you read only the english 
but accompany the this, uh, the study with uh, reference to the charts. If you see it visually, it's not so confusing. It's quite clear. It's pretty simple stuff actually. Okay, so uh, if we look at Okay, so if we just go to Fred, have I linked to this uh, website here, Fred, as one of your links? No, I haven't linked to Fred. So this is another very okay uh, so we'll, we'll come to this so please note that i put in one more just a little bit of a digression okay uh, you might see that i i tend to jump a little bit between uh, this point and the other point okay but if you get confused please ask anytime something is not flowing smoothly any discussion is not flowing smoothly please ask okay anytime that you have any confusion about this uh, i have not covered something properly okay you've not understood it please ask the net seems to be a little slow. Okay, so um, it's not even loading properly. Uh, it's not loaded properly. So uh, this uh, particular website is the St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve Bank, which is a very good website for uh, economics uh, related uh, discussions. Okay. It seems to be a, okay see here this one very good uh, instead of reading uh, you know all kinds of garbage here and there on the internet read uh, you can refer they have working papers they have uh, blogs and stuff so you can read this very good website I'm just gonna put it here you can put it in today's discussion itself so here's another link for you uh, very good and lots of data uh, lots of data that is available here okay you can um, uh, look at this data. Let me just give you something. Yeah. So that lot of economic data is available on this website. Very high quality data. It's being maintained by this Federal Reserve Bank. And you can also read their blogs and stuff like that. What is happening here? This is a network problem. So if I switch to my... No, it's okay. So... Uh, So this is not, uh, we needed more data actually, maybe we should have had uh, federal funds rate, I should have gone with the federal funds rate. Okay, so you can already see this here, okay guys what is this, this is one of the most important uh, interest rates in the world, okay this is the uh, interest rate that uh, you cannot see the percentages there, okay. This is the interest rate that the US Treasury is paying to borrow for this maturity, 10 years. Okay, this is the yield to maturity. You're all familiar with yield to maturity, right? So this is the yield to maturity on US uh, Treasury securities. These are debt securities, okay, for 10 years. And you can see how that has fluctuated. So I was talking to you about cycles. So the, the other basic point that I would make since I've linked you to that particular longer note on cyclicality is that uh, it's a very simple idea. You can see that by now you can see that almost every type of asset price and every type of economic variable, I'll show you some examples of economic variables, uh, they exhibit cyclicality. You can see that now every asset price. By asset price we mean stuff like bond, bond, bond deals, okay, and uh, stock prices, okay currency exchange rates and things like that okay everything these are what we refer to as asset prices so by now everybody is clear that these things exhibit uh, 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 a trends and uptrends and downtrends yes sir. is everyone clear chog is not convinced chog is the skeptic okay so uh, it's not bad to be a s skeptic Okay, let's see how much data we have on this. So, I don't know if they have put monthly data on this. 
data seems to be quite the the data set seems to be quite limited. And on top of that are uh, okay. So a little bit here, you can see. Uh, so this is the dollar against the Swiss franc. Okay. So what I mean to say is that you can see whether you look at a currency, uh, whether you look at an exchange rate, or whether you look at a, a commodity price, like I showed you crude oil prices. Okay. You can see crude oil prices were also uh, moving in uptrend. In fact, this is a better. Probably crude oil is a better way to uh, show you uh, what we were talking about. Okay. Yeah, so you see now in this weekly chart of crude oil, which is covering a long period actually from 1985 onwards. Now you can see that any any asset price that you can look at. This is the commodity price. Okay, uh, if you look at it, you'll see that there are uptrends and there are downtrends. Is that clear? Every, you can see that and you can call up anything. You can look at all the stock prices that you want to look at. You will see this uh, phenomenon. Okay. So what we are saying now is this. We are just adding a dimension of cyclicality. We are just adding another term. What we are saying is that there is a, uh, that's why this DFF is a better example. Even here you can see. Everybody understands. You remember what the sine curve is? Okay. You remember sign, in a sine curve you have a clean up and down movement. Okay. So if we have here, maybe we have a link to a sine curve the sine wave okay so this is the idealized cycle so that this is what we're learning a little bit you you will also therefore the, you're also going to be trained to look out for these patterns okay because you are going to find this is totally empirical there's nothing theoretical about this okay so you see sine and cosine from curves okay so just look any we are just discussing the either of the curves you look at so you can see here that uh, there is a this is an idealized cycle so the sine curve, cosine curve is these are all idealized cycles because you see that uh, it is moving in uh, the bounds are clear, uh, constant, okay, and it's moving up and down nicely in a neat, symmetrical kind of fashion, okay. This is an idealized cycle, okay. You have access to this note, so you can generate this. You, this is already in your notes, okay. So you can access all the material over here. You don't need to write this down, but whatever. Uh, so uh, as long as you're clear about that, okay. So this is the idealized cycle. So can you see that in this kind? of cycle when we look at a cycle we typically measure a cycle either from low point to low point we say that it's gone up and then it has come down here so either you measure from low to low or you measure from high to high either way is okay all right but you should mention what you are referring to okay because when you especially when you look at financial markets and economic data it's not going to be as regular as a sine curve okay this is a high, highly idealized uh, structure so but this gives you the idea of the cycle that there is you know it rises from a point and then it comes back to that point okay this is the idealized cycle so from here you get and so what we are saying is that in any cycle consists of an uptrend and a downtrend okay either the uptrend comes first or the downtrend comes first if it's a high to high then the downtrend comes first then it's followed by the uptrend this is clear so all we are doing is we are adding another theoretical construct we are saying that there are uptrends and our downtrends and there are downtrends which we studied the other day okay and now we are going back uh, we are almost studying it in reverse ideally what we should do is we should study from first we look at a cycle and then we see that a cycle is cons uh, uh, consists of uptrends and downtrends but because i'm in such a panic about the time pressure of amount of material i have to cover i was trying to focus just on the bare minimum you need to know okay but i think this this uh, cycle aspect is also important to look at because you'll see this feature in market prices as well okay so is this clear so far we are talking about an idealized cycle in the sine curve but in fact what happens is uh, in real life what happens is you can see here even in the oil price now I did not draw this with my hand just to make it look like a cycle this is real stuff okay this is real stuff that is going on and you can see almost an idealized cycle here as an example okay uh, that you have this uptrend and then of course this part is not so neat okay and then going down all right so you can see my cyclicality in all the uh, asset prices that you look at so you and so therefore you will see this uh, cyclical movement in asset prices and then you'll see obviously because if there is cyclical movement there is an uptrend and there is a downtrend okay and every time you look inside an uptrend and downtrend you will find this pattern there's a high there's a lower high there's another lower high 
okay and then there's a low then there's a lower low another lower low and so so this kind of sawtooth pattern you'll find everywhere okay and then of course you don't really know when that trend is going to uh, get neutralized okay so we say that when any of those uh, higher uh, lower high and low okay higher high and low this pattern gets uh, destroyed we say that the uptrend or the downtrend is neutralized okay or you can say it's no longer in pro progress or whatever so some so so this is what but you do see that one is one thing that is very clear is that you can see for long periods this kind of pattern persisting so you do see clear uptrends and downtrends in market prices and then you see this uh, obviously that is uh, exhibiting uh, that is proof of a cyclical movement uh, cyclical uh, tendency in, in market prices okay so what I was showing you here is that you'll see it almost everywhere so this is not a neat cycle because it's kind of overbalancing to the downside okay and of course we don't have much data because this is starting from 1962 so if you go back to 1945 then it's more balanced but even here you can see something which is again I didn't draw it with my hands this is a plot of how much what interest rate the US Treasury has been paying uh, on its 10 year bonds okay 10 year debt security these are actually called 10 year notes but essentially they are bond market securities okay later on you will learn the distinction between money markets and bond markets when we do the understanding uh, taxonomy of capital markets okay so can you see the cyclical movement here as well and can you see in the downtrend once again high lower high lower high lower high lower high this pattern is going on okay and it's not really been broken unless you look at the small patterns here and this is the movement account this is basically it this is when you have the the Trump election and there's a big jump in interest rates okay and uh, now again it's coming back almost it's down to two percent so you can see this long and you can also see all the historical uh, data and this the gray part can you see the gray parts okay so the gray parts are recessions okay you can play with these charts you have a lot of data on this website enormous amount of data you can keep uh, playing with data and this is all empirical stuff all the stuff you see here see here is all real stuff okay how did interest rates move okay so there's nothing subjective about this this is how it moved period you can't have a second opinion on this okay you may like it or you may not like it but this is what it was okay so another one which gives you a better indication of cycles i think here the data is a little bit better i mean slightly no more data we have yeah this is from 1955 now this is essentially the uh this is what we call the this is the equivalent of the, the this is the u.s equivalent of what is the policy rate in india called you understand monetary policy and fiscal policy right who is going to explain difference between monetary policy and fiscal policy saloni tell us the difference give her the mic what are the difference between monetary policy and fiscal policy voices is it coming through the mic yeah yeah monetary is monetary policy to money matters and but that's not good enough you can't as a finance student you can't say obviously monetary policy is related to money matters the Japanese economy is related to Japan <laughs> so, so give us more detail on what exactly monetary policy is who conducts monetary policy RBI. don't say RBI I'm asking you a general question I didn't ask you who conducts Indian monetary policy I asked you a general theoretical question who conducts monetary policy central banks. central banks now that is the right answer okay so at this level of abstraction you should say central bank so I didn't ask you who conducts monetary policy in India okay so central banks conduct monetary policy how do they conduct monetary policy in the modern age typically how do you see most central banks uh, like the US Federal Reserve the European Central Bank the Reserve Bank of India how do you see or let's just focus on because those two other banks are using some other techniques uh, but in India let's say how does the Reserve Bank of India conduct monetary policy what is the main tool of monetary policy in India is my question clear not clear you are not clear as to what the main tool is okay let's give it to Tanya Okay. Uh, the rate at which the bank, uh, the commercial bank, can lend money from the central bank. 
lend money from the central bank. Take money from the central bank and uh, the reverse deposit also add to its fees. Central bank can uh, take borrow money from the commercial bank. Okay. So yeah. So it's the, it's the repo rate that we call uh, that we use in India. So it's in the, in international markets it's called the repo rate. Okay. The way they pronounce it. It's a short form of repurchase agreement. Okay. So it comes from repurchase agreement, which we will cover later on when we do bond markets in detail. So essentially, the policy to the short answer to the question of what is the main monetary policy tool in India? The answer to that is the repo rate. Okay, and uh, essentially that pulls up the reverse repo rate as well. So when they change the repo rate, so that is the rate at which the banks can borrow. My mic just went out, yeah. but anyway. So uh, we'll try to use. Uh, the, I want to prevent myself from shouting. So I would like to use your mic. It was already looking a little dodgy with the because the light had gone red. Okay. All right. So the main tool of monetary policy in India is the repo rate. Okay. Essentially, it's the rate. And what exactly is the repo rate? Is she already explained it? Okay. So it's the rate at which banks can borrow from the Reserve Bank of India. Okay. And this is a case of this is a case of securitized borrowing. Okay, so they're borrowing. They are borrowing using government securities as collateral, and sometimes the Reserve Bank may uh, designate other securities which are also acceptable as collateral. Okay, but generally the understanding is that when you are borrowing through repo transactions from the central bank, it is uh, you, the collateral that you are going to be using is government securities. Okay, so. Uh, what you are seeing on this chart is the US equivalent of the Indian repo rate. This is what is called the effective federal funds rate, okay, which is essentially a weighted average of this is again the rate which is prevailing in US money markets for borrowing reserve funds. Okay, you guys have all done this concept of fractional reserve bankings banking as a system CRR you know what CRR is yes. we've already done this cash reserve ratio right so every bank this is a system that is quite common to most of these uh, anglo-saxon more I mean uh, model uh, economy and even the continental European economies most countries practice this is called fraction the new term that you're learning it's called fractional reserve banking okay so uh, we can write this down here as um, some of the things that we are covering so fractional reserve banking this is again a term so if somebody asks you what is fractional reserve banking sounds like a big word but you already know what it is okay that in every country that follows fractional reserve banking which is pretty much every country today every developed country today i mean developed and developing so uh, what you have the scheme is essentially this that uh, the the central bank is going to look at your total deposits okay so in india we use this expression ndtl you heard this expression NDTL? Okay, NDTL is net demand and time deposit liabilities. So, in the, in the, let's take the example of India. We have, okay, so the Reserve Bank is going to, my spelling may be a little off, SS NDTL. NDTL stands for net demand and time deposit liabilities. Okay, all demand deposits and time deposits, NDTL. So what the Reserve Bank is going to do, and it's the same system pretty much everywhere else. You might call it something else, but in the US, in the UK, in Japan, everywhere else, it's the same system. They all follow fractional reserve banking. So the basic idea is always going to be the same. Even in Japan, the Bank of Japan is going to look at your deposit liabilities. Okay, and you assess the deposit liabilities, and then you say to the banks that you can only lend out a certain fraction or, or you say to the banks that a certain fraction of your deposits you must keep you can't lend out everything so if you've got like a hundred million dollars of deposits okay you can't make hundred million dollars worth of loans okay you can make something less than hundred million dollars and that ex uh, the part that you have to keep is the cash reserve requirement okay so we say this is the reserve requirement okay so in fractional reserve racking you have something called a reserve requirement okay CRR is the reserve requirement so this the, this is a something which the um, the central bank can play around with okay so if the central bank wants to uh, create a, a environment of looser monetary policy more relaxed monetary policy environment uh, are they likely to raise the reserve requirement or lower the reserve requirement? They will lower the reserve, re reserve requirements. Okay, so you'll notice what the People's Bank of China, 
because China is facing a lot of uh, headwinds right now, the Chinese economy. So one of the things the PBOC has been doing, the People's Bank of China, is they've been trying to lower the reserve requirements as well. Okay, They try many different kinds of techniques, but one of the things they do is they try to lower the reserve requirements so that there is more credit available to the economy. Okay, So you should understand this term and uh, you already know the mechanism, but you know that now you've learned a new term which refers to this kind of system, fractional reserve banking. And so essentially the idea is to try to remember the general ideas, okay, the general framework which you can apply in every country, okay, so that basically the central bank is going to assess the total amount of, at, a, at a point of time. So they will take a snapshot at a point of time and look at your uh, total deposit liabilities, how much money the depositors have placed with you. And then they will put this constraint saying that, okay, certain percent, X percentage of this amount, you have to keep in cash reserves at the central bank. Okay, you understand that every central bank has uh, uh, every, uh, let's look at your uh, calc file. Okay, so most of this, uh, most of these diagrams are already in your, yeah, this is not, okay, let's try to use this, uh, I'm just going to use this as a, uh, you know, uh, as a way to illustrate the idea of uh, concentric circles okay so forget about what's actually written on this page or maybe we could just uh, make a duplicate of this so that you don't have to imagine too much okay so I'm going to write FRB which is fractional reserve banking is that okay FRB also stands for Federal Reserve Banks. Okay. Okay. So CB. So let's just have a few CBs so that I don't have to write too many. Uh, we're just going to have a few CBs. Okay. So we'll call this CB3. CB4. Okay. And then on the outer circle, you have, uh, okay, corporates. Then you have. All right. Okay. So this is just a schema. Now this is already in your notes, so you don't need to take notes. Okay. Uh, this is why I don't do. I I rarely use, uh, use the black uh, the whiteboard because I want everything to be available to you, whatever uh, is being drawn on the board, right? So. Uh, so this is how this fractional reserve system works. I think you already are, are familiar with this. So you have a central bank and then you have the first circle around the central bank, you have the commercial banks. Okay. So the CBs are the commercial banks. Okay. So the first circle around the central bank. The idea is that this is a, a circle and then you have the second circle around the, which is uh, beyond the central, uh, the commercial banks. There you have all the, if you use the language of law, all the natural persons and artificial persons. Okay. So corporations are what are natural or artificial? Artificial persons. Okay. And individuals are natural persons. Okay. So uh, instead of writing corporate and individual, that would have been better to write uh, natural and artificial persons. It is, it is uh, a more formal way of writing it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so this is the, so you have essentially, you've got one center and you've got two circles around the center. Okay. Two concentric circles. So the idea is that all the commercial banks okay all the scheduled commercial banks that in India we have this concept of scheduled commercial bank these are essentially the banks which have been designated by RBI as participating in that system okay so all the scheduled commercial banks will have uh, they have to maintain uh, those who want to be part of the banking system essentially you have to maintain an account with the reserve bank okay with the central bank is that clear so every bank has to have an account with the reserve bank and that account will have debit or credit balance whatever okay so uh, now the idea, so what the Reserve Bank is saying when we are talking about the connection between this, it's important to have the schema in your head 
okay so in the first circle you have the central banks and in the second circle you have the uh, natural and artificial persons okay so the idea is that if you want to connect this schema to the idea of fractional reserve banking when the central bank says that you have so many deposits have you guys already covered this material am i repeating it or what it's a new stuff for you right yes, sir. okay so if i'm ever repeating stuff which has already been taught then please let me know okay don't just sit there like that and watch you know what is this guy doing you know so <laughs> so please let me know because i may not be aware of everything that's been taught to you okay so when the connection between this and fractional reserve banking is you know that in fractional reserve banking the basic idea is at a point of time the central bank takes a snapshot of your total di uh, deposits liabilities okay so uh, then the central bank says that a certain x percentage of that deposit liabilities you will have to maintain as a cash reserve okay with the central bank now where do you maintain it you maintain it at this account that you maintain with the central bank so the central bank will see and the way it works operationally is that they will take a snapshot at a point of time t0 okay and usually they will impose the requirement as an average you understand when you maintain accounts with commercial banks they have this concept of average quarterly balance aqb right so it's again they're going to say on average balance basis typically for the next fortnight so if they take it as t0 so the t0 they see that you have 100 million dollars worth of deposits okay and let's say this the cash reserve ratio uh, is 10 percent okay so then in that case you have 10 million dollars that you have to maintain for the next fortnight on an average quarterly i mean average balance average daily balance basis okay so you can miss a few days but then the other few days you have to make up so that you have on average you have maintained a daily balance of 10 million okay so if you go to a commercial bank treasury every commercial bank will have a treasury department and one of at the treasury department will have typically a money market desk and a foreign exchange desk okay so on the money market desk one of the important things that a money market desk has to do uh, in a commercial bank treasury one of the fu important functions is to make sure that this uh, cash reserve requirement is being complied with okay so the money market desk will know what is our requirement for this fortnight so once you have once you hit t0 and the central bank you have to report your deposit liabilities to the central bank okay so you reported 100 million dollars and you already know what the cash reserve ratio is 10 percent okay so now you know that you have to maintain because the money market desk at the central at the commercial bank will have a uh, minute to minute uh, access to their they will have an, an understanding of what what they are maintaining with the central bank okay so now for the next 14 t0 plus 14 this money market desk will be tasked with ensuring that they maintain that cash reserve requirement of 10 million dollars average daily balance for this next upcoming fortnight at the central bank is this clear to everybody yes everyone is clear vaishali you don't seem convinced are you convinced okay you think the ratio is too high 10 percent okay verma you're following okay so verma has done a, we should give verma a big hand verma has managed to qualify after giving and he uh, he put in a lot of effort okay so i found it very encouraging he put in a lot of effort and he was very anxious to make sure that he qualified and he was the most serious of all the students who were trying to get in so it would have been very sad if he didn't qualify but he has qualified so good so anyway so as i said keep up the hard work and this is what uh, i mean you need to put in a lot of effort okay so uh, in fact when i look at you guys i see everybody looking very happy and relaxed actually i want to see you looking much more stressed out because you need to work much harder so when you coming when you come in your hair should be all over the place you don't like when i see you guys you should look much more stressed out when i look at you guys you look all very relaxed everybody seems to be i mean you should be on a war footing here you know so the amount of material that you guys have to cover is a lot of material okay so uh, i want to see you guys looking much more stressed out uh, when i see you you look very happy and relaxed okay so a little digression yes nothing right? never mind let's continue okay so the message is that you have to work a lot harder don't take it easy this is a special phase in your life when you should be work working on a war footing okay so there are a lot of material to cover okay so we had a little digression 
so uh, is this clear to everybody what the scheme is so now you've learned a lot about the uh, so obviously I can't write down everything okay that's how you that's why you have the video but you make sure that you understand you play back the video look at the chart look at the schema and now everything should be completely stamped into your brain once you finish the revision of this material and it applies to everything else that we discussed everything should be completely permanently stamped into your brain this whole idea of fractional reserve banking commercial banks central banks treasury department inside the commercial bank money market desk inside the treasury department and one of one of the key jobs of the money market desk is to make sure that the cash reserve requirement is maintained and how is it calculated how does it operationally work that you take the snapshot then for the next fortnight maintain the daily balance and how does this work so this why did we get into this discussion one of the ways that the central uh, the commercial banks can maintain this money market balance uh, this balance okay maybe they've lent out too much money maybe they don't have enough money with the central bank in their in the in their central bank account okay so one of the things let's say city bank is running short okay so one of the things they can do is uh, they can call up other banks so you have the what is called the interbank money market in india we call that the call money market okay that is just an indian uh, uh, expression but really what you have to call, uh, if you want to use the general expression for that you should say interbank money market for re interbank market for reserve funds okay so therefore i think we should put this thing down here reserve requirement okay uh, interbank this is a very important market because the massive volumes which go through here interbank market okay so this interbank market essentially the players are all the money market desks of all the commercial banks everybody's playing with each other whoever has excess wants to lend whoever has shortage and wants to borrow and they get together and they uh, lend and borrow between each other okay so this is essentially the interbank market so these are the general terms that we want to use uh, we don't want to use india specific terms we want to use uh, general terms because you're learning the theory at this stage and you should be able to apply it to any situation in the world okay so interbank market for reserve funds so you have an interbank market for reserve funds so essentially what is happening is city bank is short uh, they don't have enough money in their central bank account that but they find out that JP Morgan and usually you have brokers also anytime you have a market you're going to have you could well have brokers okay just like in India you have a real estate market you see many brokers operating there brokers are just trying to smooth the information flow all the participants don't have all the information the brokers are essentially kind of like conduits for information so in the money market you can also have brokers okay so you'll see that when you go there uh, into this okay I've shut that uh, thing but when you look at the listing of uh, different types of financial firms okay uh, you'll see one category called agency brokers okay those are pure brokers who are not uh, who are acting as uh, representatives of other uh, you know primary players okay essentially acting as uh, agents for principals so those are the brokers they are listed there as well so Citibank uh, may either deal directly with JP Morgan okay they may have a hotline the banks also have hotlines between each other so money market desk if you go to the money market desk of a major bank you will find they will have a major switchboard with lots of hotlines so big banks would have hotlines to each other so Citibank might just call up the hotline of JP Morgan's money market desk and say I'm short to you can you lend me 100 million or whatever okay so uh, the, then the guy will say what are yes or no or Citibank could also go through uh, could also get a call from a money market broker like a turret Prebon or Cantor Fitzgerald one of these brokers the brokers will call and say okay I have a bank who wants to lend do you have any interest to borrow okay then the Citibank guy will say okay I want to borrow so in this interbank market for reserve funds they will be borrowing and lending are you following the scheme because everybody needs to show the central bank that I have money in my reserve fund so essentially what will happen here is if Citibank borrows if let's say this is Citibank and this is JP Morgan if Citibank borrows from JP Morgan okay what JP Morgan will do is they will just send an uh, instruction to the central bank saying that please debit my account for 100 million and transfer it to Citibank's account because they have more than 100 million excess in their reserve balance uh, reserve account with the central bank are you following this in the settlement instructions when the JP Morgan will tell the central bank that I've done a deal with uh, Citibank I have lent money to Citibank so please debit my account for 100 million and lend it to uh, and, and credit the account of Citibank 
for five days whatever the period of the loan is okay are you following yes. okay so that ensures that for the next five days that 100 million shows as a average balance of Citibank not JP Morgan because they've done the borrowing here are you following Chuk, are you following how how will they how will it because no 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 suppose uh, we have come to we have used this 10 10 percent calculation and we have found that for the next five days Citibank is short 100 million no no sorry those numbers I have changed around the numbers I should not have uh, when I say 100 million deposit don't connect that to the next 100 million so the figures I'm giving you as example are not uh, let's not say 100 million in the borrowing transaction let's just call it say 5 million then it will reduce your confusion because we started with an example where the total deposits of Citibank is 100 million and they are required to maintain say 10 percent of that okay so I think you're getting confused only because I gave the example of borrowing as a hundred million amount that is just a casual amount that I cooked up okay it's not meant to be related to the example but if you want to relate it meaningfully to the example which we should probably and that then let's make it hunt five million let's say we are not borrowing hundred million we're borrowing only five million so I'm five million short for the next five days so uh, Citibank wants to borrow five million from JP Morgan and then JP Morgan after the borrowing transaction is done one of the settlement instructions they'll have to send is to send the central bank because these are the guys who are maintaining the account otherwise how will the transfer take place right if I have agreed to buy a house from you for three crores I have to give the instruction to my HDF uh, my account bank account saying that please transfer three crores to Chuk's account otherwise how will the transfer take place so the instruction has to go to the person who is holding the account I mean who, where the account is domiciled are you following operationally how it works because the accounts are maintained with the reserve uh, with the central bank right so when you do a money market transaction you have to give instructions to the central bank saying that please credit debit my account and credit the borrowers account this is clear otherwise the transfer will not happen this is clear to everyone yes, yes are you following yes okay so this is what is happening now obviously uh, so far everyone's clear okay interbank market for reserve funds okay so now uh, obviously if you borrow money what do we have to is there something else we have to negotiate interest rate, interest rate. obviously there has to be an interest rate okay so what you're seeing is this this is the US uh, uh, main tool of US monetary policy for a long time actually and currently it is the main tool of US monetary policy which is the target for the federal uh, the central bank looks at a target federal funds rate and this is an effective rate which is inside that target range uh, the central bank uses a range uh, for uh, federal funds and essentially this effective federal funds rate is the rate at which uh, it's a weighted average rate at which actual transactions have taken place in the US money markets so you can see that off late they have been looking at you know rates around two and a half percent okay uh, at which when these banks do because these things keep have to continue happening okay whether the economy is doing well or poorly or whatever these things have to continue happening all the time so currently you can see that they're borrowing at around two and a half percent when they have to do these interbank transactions and reserve funds so this stuff is called reserve funds okay this uh, you know cash reserve requirement that is there in any central uh, fractional reserve banking system this uh, the fact that you have I mean the money that you maintain with the central bank the money that you are maintaining with the central bank towards the satisfaction of that requirement that money is called reserve funds essentially okay so this uh, market for and, and all the money that you maintain with the central bank is called a reserve fund so either you have excess reserves or you are short of reserves and then accordingly you will lend and borrow so this is clear are you following so far yes. you've learned a lot of new terms and you should understand the whole schema so everything is uh, to be covered as one module okay fractional reserve banking uh, monetary policy main tools of monetary policy in most countries there is some kind of uh, uh, the at the moment ma main tool in most countries is this kind of a short-term interest rate a money market interest rate okay so essentially the reserve bank tries to control the rate at which uh, banks will borrow reserve funds from each other okay 
so uh, that is basically uh, how they maintain uh, you know try to control credit conditions okay so one more thing that remember when you're studying all the material that you've covered okay try to organize it into modules okay so so that you have later on when you are asked in interviews in the, in the interviews you'll have two types of questions okay either there'll be questions from the blue out of the blue which uh, you have no way of anticipating okay so they may ask you whatever they want to ask you right and then uh, there are a sec and so either you can answer that question or you can't usually uh, they will give you especially if you've not been able to answer the first type of question they'll give you an option say and say that okay tell us what you've learned okay tell us what you've studied so when you get a question like that don't give like broad answers like okay i've studied about stock markets or i've studied about financial markets so what you should try to do when you get that kind of question is to give very tightly defined uh, subtopics okay so if you say for instance you could say i've learned about fractional reserve banking so that becomes like a subtopic which is a reasonably tightly defined module okay so in that then they'll say if you what have you learned about fractional reserve then you can tell them so you should have understood that topic very well okay and then you can connect it to the idea for interbank market uh, fund i mean the interbank money market okay for reserve funds then how uh, it's connected to the monetary policy the conduct of monetary policy are you following what i'm saying yes. so this is beca this becomes a, a, a i mean a a collection of uh, you know small topics okay which are you know connected in some way which is basically all connected to fractional reserve banking and how the interbank money market works and how banks central banks conduct monetary policy so all these ideas you can give them in a discussion which is going to be similar to what we just discussed okay and then that becomes a module and then you can show your expertise on that subject matter okay small subject area and that helps you to make a good impression if you give very wide topics like i studied about stock markets so they might ask you some esoteric aspect of stock markets which you have not covered then you're going to look like a fool so don't give them uh, so when you're studying the material that you've uh, been taught try to organize it into subtopics which are kind of logically correlated to one another okay so like conduct of monetary policy is quite closely correlated to the idea of banks having to maintain reserve funds because the most of the central banks today are targeting that interbank interest rate okay so in india also we target the interest rate at which they can borrow reserve funds okay it's not the interbank interest rate but they can borrow it from the central bank but it's related to the same purpose which is having to maintain reserve funds in a fractional reserve banking system are you following okay so everything is connected so try to identify ideas that are connected to each other and organize them into modules or subtopics okay and then uh, you know so when you do your review of your syllabus organize and, and have these subtopics in your mind that if you are asked in an interview I, I, and master these subtopics okay and then make sure that when you are asked in an interview if you are given an opportunity to talk about what you've learned you give very well defined and tightly defined subtopics rather than broad answers like stock markets or bond markets and things like that okay this is clear all right okay so um So notes also if you find you'll notice that sometimes see what i'm doing here is that if i find that the material is not going to be within the natural flow of uh, notes which i've prepared okay then i'm putting that material over here okay in this uh, our session outline notes so you'll have to jump around a little bit and i'll try to organize the notes in a slightly better way but this is basically the rule that if it's not falling because i want to make sure that the notes which are there with you the lecture notes they have to follow logic they have to flow logically okay so i spent a lot of time uh, uh, just organizing the flow of uh, you know subtopics it must flow naturally naturally okay so we spent a lot of time on this but at least it's good uh, it's important stuff that you needed to learn so if you internalized all this that's good so once again we came to this chart because it shows you a very good example of cyclicality can you see that almost a perfect kind of cycle okay in something which is not really like i did draw this chart with my hand the stuff has just ha been happening over the years and as it turns out it's traced out this is actually an interest rate this is almost like an economic variable okay because it's happening because of directly happening because of economic uh, pressures and uh, and yet you see how uh, neatly almost a cyclical clean cyclical movement has been uh, demonstrated here and once again you can see in a cycle uptrends downtrends and any downtrend or uptrend 
higher uh, lower highs in a downtrend lower lows and the uptrend same feature higher highs higher lows is this clear so does this give you a little bit more of a structure now when you're looking at charts you don't feel so lost because you can start to identify cycles you can start to identify downtrends and uptrends okay and you can start to see how a particular phase of the uptrend or downtrend uh, might get uh, neutralized and then okay so like you can see here there is an uptrend happening here so far but then as it drops below this okay this is during the financial crisis okay as it drops sharply below this this high you can see high 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 higher high next high a uh, low higher low next low and then this drops below this right so it breaks it kind of neutralizes the uptrend this is clear okay so you can see that while there are uptrends they also get neutralized okay so it gives you a little bit more of structure to look at uh, do you agree that with this idea of cycles and trends and the definitions of trend uptrends and downtrends that it gives you a little bit more of uh, of a structure to uh, with which to examine uh, price charts yes are you convinced okay no you don't have to be convinced just because i'm saying it but hopefully you you this gives you some kind of uh, structure to put on market prices okay so uh, so for instance if you look at uh, so so this is what we were looking at this is essentially the whole discussion started from this last discussion that we had and instead of just looking at uptrend and downtrend definitions and i've also introduced the idea of cycles okay and i've shown you some examples of cyclicality and uh, which you can see in the in the real world and so therefore and then we went into the long discussion on uh, fractional reserve banking and the conduct of uh, monetary policy let me try and show you something more interesting okay let's look at uh, so far you could say that the two things that i showed you the 10 year us treasury interest rate and the effective federal funds rate which is the money market uh, the monetary policy rate in the us you could say that these are really more in the nature of asset prices because they are market prices like interest rate is the market price of borrowing okay but when we look at uh, this is actually max yeah now you look at this this is the civilian unemployment rate in the us okay so as you can see whenever we have this kind of a crisis this is the 2007 crisis the unemployment rate shoots up does that make sense okay because you have a recessionary environment people or companies are not making money they are laying off people because they are not able to sell products okay so uh, then the unemployment rate shoots up okay previously also you had a higher unemployment rate this is during the 1980 recession but can you see cyclicality in this series you can see it okay again it's not something that i drew with my hands just to make you look at the cyclical uh, patterns but this is again real stuff okay this is a real unemployment rate so they actually uh, one of the things you learn about um, uh, about the economy is that in the us there are actually seven measures of unemployment so this is actually something you can learn as well that the unemployment actually there are depends on how you measure the uh, the base population the denominator so the, you can actually learn about the seven measures of unemployment in the us okay you can query that if you are curious about economic analysis but this is basically this i think is this is called the the uh, the u6 okay which is uh, looks at basically all those people who are either working as the denominator is either working or uh, looking actively looking for work or would be we have not stopped uh, have stopped looking for work only for a few uh, short period so anyway this is the unemployment rate you can see this and you can see how even something like the unemployment rate which is a very purely economic variable even that moves in cyclical patterns and there also you see uptrends and you see the same thing you see uptrends and downtrends and you can see the same patterns can you see that higher highs higher lows okay same patterns you can see so therefore this is a very useful uh, uh, piece of theory to be armed with the idea of cyclicality and every cycle having uptrends and downtrends and the definition of uptrends and downtrends being higher i mean that higher highs and lows lower highs and lows okay so uh, so it's a useful structure to have in your mind when you're looking at uh, market prices okay so just to show you this that economic variables also move in this manner okay so um, okay so we've covered this now let's now what we are going to do now is essentially going to try and cover the
okay let's try and cover as much as we can on this okay so uh, we are going to quickly run through some definitions okay it's organized in modules this is your uh, so the first thing I want to define is we're going to define a market okay because we, uh, these are definitions which will remain as clear technical definitions throughout your uh, curriculum all the material you cover then we will never change this definition okay so essentially we are just calling uh, which you can you can read this a little bit okay but um, essentially for our pur purposes a, mar a market is going to be defined as a venue for the exchange of two assets okay and assets we are defining in a very general in a very general way everything is an asset commodities are also assets money is also an asset I mean different currencies are also assets okay commodities are also assets uh, bonds are also assets okay equities are also asset everything is an asset okay and so it, an asset concept of asset includes goods okay all goods are assets but all assets need not be goods some of the assets are essentially stuff like equities and bonds equities and debt which are not equity and debt securities which are not really goods okay uh, but uh, in, in the layman's sense of the term and so these are so so the first definition that we encounter is a market is a venue for the exchange of assets okay this will be useful to bring structure to lots of other complicated problems okay so you can read through this definition here later on okay uh, if you have any problems you can ask me again you go through the notes we are trying to cover it a little bit fast because we want to cover a lot of material okay are you okay read this later on but the first working definition here the important concept here is that a market is defined as a venue for the exchange of assets okay in a general way okay so uh, a financial market again is so here sorry what we have designed defined is um, okay so in the in the longer version of the note we say that a market is I mean the general definition of market is goods and services for money okay but in the financial market context we will only talk about as assets which are going to include all goods as well but we are not going to talk about exchange of services okay so in the concept two new terms we should learn today before we finish okay is this concept of base asset and terms asset okay in every market there will be a concept of base asset and terms asset this is what we need to learn because what did we say that a market is a venue for the exchange of two assets okay so those two assets we are giving them particular names now we are calling one a base asset and one is a terms asset now what does that mean let's look at this oil chart that will give you an idea so this price that you see 56.45 is a price for one barrel of oil okay so in this market we say that oil is the base asset okay west texas intermediate crude oil is the base asset and what is the terms asset in this market anybody price no price cannot be an asset when you want if you want to buy one barrel of oil what will you have to give because everything is an exchange yeah so us dollars okay so the terms asset is us dollars okay in this market in the international crude oil market the base asset is in general terms you can just say oil okay but when you, when you want to be very specific you have to say you have to mention the crude uh, the grade of oil also this is the west because the price for brent crude oil is different okay so you have to when you want to be very specific you have to say this is west texas intermediate crude oil okay the spot price of west texas intermediate crude oil is 56.46 okay and so here the base asset is crude oil west texas intermediate crude oil and the terms asset in us is us dollars okay how would you remember this the idea here is that the base asset is what is being priced okay let's just complete these two important concepts market is a venue for the exchange of assets those two assets base asset terms asset base asset is the asset which is being priced okay so if you are looking at the sugar market in india it is the sugar that is being priced okay so suppose it is say 20 rupees a kilo then it is being priced as 20 rupees. it is the sugar price that is fluctuating but it's always one unit of sugar that is being priced the kilo is the unit over here okay so it's always a particular market may be trading in quick kilos or quintals or whatever but that remains fixed so one kilo is being priced and that price is fluctuating so sugar is the base asset and what will be the terms asset in the Indian sugar market rupees. rupees Indian rupees will be the terms asset okay so the base asset is basically what is being priced okay and it's base because it never changes 
So in the sugar market, you're pricing, let's say one kilo of sugar. In the oil market, you're pricing one barrel of oil. So that stuff never changes. You're always pricing one bar dollar of one barrel of oil. At one time, it may be worth $147, at one point it may be worth $56. But the fact that it's one barrel of oil that is being priced, that never changes. Is that clear? That's why it's like a base. A base is something which is kind of fixed. It doesn't change. It's a base. So that's why we call it the base asset. Okay. That is the one which is being priced and it never changes. Yes, Rajan? So, sir, we use this for just for commodities market or every market? Every market. Okay. That's why we are defining. That's why you'll see that the theory works in a, as general a way as possible. Okay. So, we will use this for currency markets, for debt markets, for equity markets, for commodity markets, everywhere. It's a general definition of markets of venue for exchanging two assets the two assets are always going to be called base asset and terms asset base asset is the one that is being priced and why is it being called the terms asset okay just take one minute of your time why is it being called the terms asset we'll cover it again next next class but try to revise it because it's in terms of rupees or in terms of rupee uh, or terms of dollars that the base asset is being priced how is crude oil being priced not in terms of Japanese yen not in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, euros but in terms of US dollars okay one barrel of US one barrel of crude oil is being priced in terms of US dollars you're following the English language here okay it's being priced in terms of US dollars that's why US dollars is the terms asset in India the sugar market one kilo of sugar is being priced in terms of Indian rupees sometimes it's 20 rupees sometimes it's 40 rupees this is clear base as so what we've learned as additional uh, you know progress on this module is market is the venue for exchanging assets two assets are going to be called base asset and terms asset okay you can go now if i owe you two minutes and 40 seconds